And now, Heidi Tong, Jack Cafferty, Jerry Gerard with sports, and Bob Harris with the weather. The Emmy Award-winning Channel 11 News at 10. Good evening. Heidi has the night off. I'm Stephanie Shelton. The mystery of royalty found dead on Park Avenue. The hunt is on tonight for the killers of a prince from India and his wife. Police say it's not clear how or why they died. Marvin Scott's on the story, though. He's standing by live outside the couple's posh apartment building at 61st and Park Avenue, and he has the latest for us. Marvin? Jack, it's a real whodunit that has police and people who live in this fashionable Park Avenue building mystified tonight. A bona fide Indian prince and his wife found dead in their five-and-a-half-room apartment, and there are no signs of forced entry. The male, he's an Indian prince, was found lying in the living room face-up. He had a neck wound. The female was found lying on her back in the living room, in the bedroom. There is no apparent cause of death for her. The fully clothed bodies were found this morning by a maid after she entered the fourth floor apartment of this exclusive condominium at 60th Street and Park Avenue. The man identified as Indian Prince Chitrish Teddy Ketker, described as a millionaire financier, and his wife of 10 years, Maneshka. He was 57, she 72. They were last seen alive on Friday. The building prides itself for its high security. TV cameras all around and a 24-hour doorman. There were no initial reports of any unusual activity, and that has police baffled. Nobody is let in without clearing through the doorman. There was no forced entry. Detectives question neighbors and employees of the building. Police say there could have been a struggle because they did find blood in several locations of the apartment. And while it's still too early for a motive, police say the apartment had been ransacked. Drawers were pulled out, closets were opened. Was it a total with the thieves or thieves in there for any long period of time? I would say no. Neighbors describe the couple as nice neighborly types. Confident, self-possessed, um, business-like people. I mean, nothing really very unusual. He's very gentle and very pleasant and always complimentary. Police are not ruling out anything tonight. What it does have all the signs of a double murder, perhaps after the couple surprise burglars, police say it also could have been a murder-suicide and that they won't know for sure until after an autopsy determines just how Princess Naneshka Kedkar met her death. I'm live on Park Avenue. This is Marvin Scott. Now back to Jack and Stephanie in the studio. Marvin, thank you. An attack on a baby by a homeless person over the weekend brings to the surface a far bigger problem. As Barry Cunningham tells us, there may be many homeless people, like the man charged, left to roam the streets who really belong in psychiatric hospitals. Homeless advocates say Jeffrey Rose knew he needed help long before he went berserk on the Upper East Side, attacking a mother with a 22-month-old toddler and stabbing the child in the face with a ballpoint pen. Caseworkers at the neighborhood homeless center on East 77th Street say they referred Rose to Bellevue Hospital, where he returned with a letter stating that he was not a danger to himself or others and that he'd been given an antipsychotic drug, Haldol. In such situations, we will readmit a person to the center. Did you know when he came here that he had a criminal record? No. Do you screen for criminal records? Um, our procedure is to ask, of course. And did you ask him? Yeah, sure. Maria! Dozens of drug addicts, drunks, and psychotic street people drop in the homeless center every day for snacks and showers. Neighborhood groups say the stabbing was a violent crime waiting to happen. I'm a young woman. I live alone. I get frightened to be on the streets with drug abusers who are known to be criminals that do anything to get their drugs. And at least if they were treating a safer group of the community, um, I think that the, we would feel a lot more comfortable with the center being here. Bellevue Hospital today acknowledged that Rose was kept for observation on the night of March 5th, evaluated by both a psychiatrist and a social worker, treated with drugs and released. Privately, case workers say he may have fallen through the cracks of the system. Homeless advocates say thousands of beds in psychiatric hospitals remain empty because state law makes it almost impossible to admit psychotic street people like Jeffrey Rose. Our problem is that we uh, are outraged by incidents like this one and like the several others that have preceded it, but we don't 
we don't maintain that outrage uh, over time. We don't require the laws to be reconsidered. Jeffrey Rose may have fallen through the cracks, but the baby stabbing gives fresh ammunition to critics who say that dangerously psychotic people should be put back into mental hospitals instead of being called homeless and allowed to roam the streets attacking people. On East 77th Street, Barry Cunningham, Channel 11, News at 10. Seven people are under arrest tonight after a major drug bust by the DEA. U.S. Attorney Michael Chertoff says agents seized 1,000 kilos of cocaine in New Jersey yesterday. The drugs, which Chertoff says were headed for the streets of New York, have a value of $100 million. Of the seven arrested, four were caught in Texas and were charged with conspiring to bring cocaine into the United States from Mexico. The other three men are from New York. A third day of jury deliberations is over. Still no verdict in the Rodney King trial in Los Angeles. A tense calm hangs over the second biggest city in the country tonight. Eric Spillman reports from the federal courthouse in L.A. All we know for sure about the 12 jurors is that they arrive early in the morning in special vans under tight security and that they've now spent more than 13 hours over three days deliberating this case. The four cops accused of violating Rodney King's civil rights pace the hallways of the court building, waiting for the verdict and wondering why it is taking so long. I do want to attend, but I want to attend with an acquittal. If they need three weeks to come back with an acquittal, that's okay with me. While the jury does its work, reporters from all over the world are camped outside to await a decision. In the meantime, community leaders are trying to ease tensions. Members of black, Hispanic, and Korean groups say they don't want to see any more rioting no matter what the verdict is. They say the trial just isn't worth it. There are bigger problems and bigger issues all throughout this nation that we all must come together on. But authorities are doing everything to be prepared for any trouble just in case. 600 National Guard troops have been called to active duty. They're standing by in Southern California armories waiting to hit the streets. All it will take is a phone call from the governor. Thousands of extra police officers are also on call. And they're making a big deal about it, and that may be stirring up sentiments that don't need to be stirred up. People need to be calm rather than seeing pictures of men crawling over tanks in armored vehicles. The city is rife with rumors that the jury has already reached a verdict and that it's being kept a secret. A spokesman for the U.S. Marshal's office says as far as he knows, that's not true. But he refuses to confirm or deny a report that the judge may be planning to delay the announcement of the verdict until law enforcement has a chance to get into place. In Los Angeles, Eric Spillman, Channel 11, News at 10. Mayor Dinkins is predicting the city will remain calm regardless of the verdict in the Los Angeles trial. Glenn Thompson is standing by live with the view from City Hall. Glenn? Well, Stephanie, last year New York City was, for the most part, spared the violence that rocked Los Angeles. And tonight, as we wait for the verdicts to come in, City Hall is working overtime to once again try to head off any violence. I think what we're talking about here tonight is the responsive mechanisms between the government agencies and the people who are out there in the community. 3,000 miles away from the hot seats of 12 Los Angeles jurors, community leaders in New York gathered tonight, planning ahead to try to prevent a repeat of the violence that racked Los Angeles from hitting close to home. We're trying to uh, work with people who have, uh, let's say, Ill, Ill feelings about possibly the verdict and things that may come about. We're trying to keep them from building up the tension that was once built up in the past. We're trying to avoid that. Mayor Jenkins believes the city is well equipped to handle any outbreaks of violence, but he isn't taking anything for granted. He says he'll have advance notice of any verdict and will take to the streets if necessary. Still, he believes New Yorkers will keep the peace. We have to be careful, of course. Uh, and, uh, but I, I say continually that violence is the answer to nothing. It just doesn't solve problems. It, you know the expression, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth will sooner or later leave us all blind and toothless. One of the key elements to peace intervention is directly addressing the city's youth. New York City has established a youth hotline which leaders here believe will help vent frustration and keep city agencies well informed of potential hotspots. That's what happened the last time people kept their feelings inside and instead of doing something productively, they just burst it out.